Good morning. What I'm going to ask, just, uh, before, before I intro uh, today's convocation speaker, what I'm going to ask is uh, this group of freshmen right here, if you could, we're going to have to organize this. If you could stand on the periphery on the side right there, the faculty could just move down a little bit and allow them to stand on the side of the street so they can see. You can get them down. All of them. everyone to do is, is uh, we have a, an opportunity to have a great convocation today. We have an amazing convocation speaker today. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to just lock in on this convocation what's being said. Uh, push away any distraction because uh, what we're going to learn today is, is kind of paramount to our faith. The convocation today is about the Shroud of Turin and that's one of the um, currently one of the most studied relics in the Catholic Church. It's believed to be uh, the burial cloth of Christ. And anyone who knows the faith, anyone who knows theology, uh, you know this, that one of the paramount beliefs of the faith is in the resurrection. So to have uh, the burial cloth of Christ uh, opens the door to a lot of questions, uh, but uh, it can also be a refresher to our faith. So we have an amazing convocation speaker today, Dr. Wayne, J. Wayne Phillips. Um, he's going to come and speak to us today about the Shroud of Turin. He's part of a 138-member Shroud Science Group. He's an alum of Jesuit High School. He graduated from Jesuit in 1964. This is his 50-year anniversary um, of his graduation. After attending Jesuit High School, he went to the University of Notre Dame. He went to medical school at the University of Miami. He also received a diploma in Shroud Studies from the Vatican Apostolorum College. He has a certification in internal medicine and in allergy immunology. Um, he specializes in speaking about the Shroud of Turin uh, to, to teens and young adults. So what I'm going to ask you to do, like I said before, lock in on this convocation. Um, get as much as you can out of this, because I promise you this, this can be one of the most amazing convocations of the year and the one we walk, walk away from with our faith renewed and rejuvenated. That's all I have to say about that. So I want to introduce Dr. J. Wayne Phillips. Um, faculty, I know you're standing in the back, and it's probably better to stand there because you can see better. I'm not sure if you can see very well. In the so um, it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here, and I want to thank Father Matt Gambier for organizing this. Uh, it's a lot of effort. I appreciate that. And Father Hermes for giving permission to do it. Should I say Father Nick? No, I don't want to say Father Nick. We would just call him Nick. So, um, for letting us do it also. So, I, I am really excited to be here to talk about a subject dear to my heart. And I want to give you a little bit of a twist on how I do this. I, I give these talks only from a scientific standpoint as a physician and a quasi scientist as a physician. Can you hear me okay? All right. So the diocese gave me permission to make these talks around the parish about three years ago. It's about the 56th time I've done this. And um, it's really an honor to be here among all these smart people. So I hope that makes it easier for me. Now, what we're going to have to do uh, time-wise, I'm going to try to talk for about 40 minutes and get all this uh, as an as a example of what we're going to talk about. And then uh, Father Matt says during the day, certain classes will be able to come in and Look at more slides, get, ask any question you want. So we're going to have to reserve questions to the end of the talk if I have time. And if I have time, I'd rather the faculty right now ask the questions in this room and you guys in the multi-purpose room uh, where the follow-ups will be able to ask any question you want. So if you want to make mental notes, uh, written notes, whatever. All right, so let me get right into it. So somebody important thought the shroud was important. That's all I'm going to say. Now, I'm going to try to keep this scientific. Everything I say out of my mouth, I hope is science. Now, I can't help it. I'm prejudiced for Christianity, so it's going to slip once in a while. If I catch myself, I'll apologize for saying I'm a Christian. All right, here we go. We're going to talk about this object, this cloth. It's either a witness of the resurrection or it's an enemy of the fraud, right? So how many have heard of the Shroud of Turin? How many have heard that in 1988, carbon dating said it was a fake? How many have heard that in 2005, new studies say it's not a fake? 
Oh, that's pretty good. You guys are uh, pretty up, up on this. Well, that's why I'm here. Why am I here talking about a fake? I wouldn't be. Because 2005, actual scientific studies were done. And I'm going to show you the studies themselves. Uh, that show that the, the carbon dating was actually poorly done and is a complete uh, travesty. All right? So that's got my enthusiasm up to make these presentations. Now, why do I make it to young people? Because in 1964, the shroud was not that uh, big on the hit parade. And I never heard about the shroud at all. And I went to Notre Dame, and I never heard about the shroud in Notre Dame. In 1976, I was watching television, you know, after doing my training. And here comes the shroud on TV, and I'm saying, what is that? All right? So I said, first of all, <coughs> the image of Christ on a cloth. Eh, not possible. Every point of the crucifixion is in details on the image. Not possible. So coming from Jesuit and doubting everything and not believing anything, I had to prove this to myself. So what did I have to do? I had to use my training as a, as a quasi-scientist doctor and an allergist, and that's how I got into this. And slowly it dawned on me that this is accurate. And I want you to know, you are so lucky if you get it on a silver platter. 2005, the data is all over the place. This was real, and I'll, there's only one science test left that'll say it's not the shroud. And I'll tell you that at the end, of course. <coughs> all right, so here we have, as the uh, Gospel of Mark says, the uh, the uh, body was taken from the cross, laid on the shroud, and it was enveloped in the shroud, laid on a slab of um, uh, quartz or, uh, or marble. And you can see that it is a stiff body. He has stiff arms, he's a rigor mortis. You can see that he's nude, okay? And you can see the long hair. So right off the bat, you can say to yourself, if this is a medieval forgery, how did they image and how did it get fake with a nude representation of Christ? That person in the Middle Ages would have been damned to you know where forever. Okay, so it's already a little bit suspicious that it's accurate because the person in the image of the shroud, the man of the shroud, is nude. All right, now three basic facts. First, it's a linen cloth. It's an expensive, super weave, uh, very fine linen cloth that survived for 2,000 years. It's not unusual to last 2,000 years. There's lots of Egyptian cloths that are 4,000 years. And there's a lot of uh, uh, Palestinian cloths that are 2,000 years. But there's no image on any of them, right? The next is blood on it. And we're going to talk about the details of the blood, and I'm going to give you everything I know as a physician. But this is the big deal. The big deal is it's a photograph. You don't know what a Polaroid camera is, but this is a photograph. This is click. Here's my resurrection picture. Thank you very much. Why don't you believe it? Right? So I truly believe that statement. Here is the picture with natural light of the Shroud of Turin. It's 14 feet long. It's 3 feet wide. And it's head to head because, remember, the body was enveloped with a cloth that went around. So the top part of the cloth is the top image, and the bottom part of the cloth is the back image. And it meets where the, the two images have been the head position. All right, now these are burn holes, so try to ignore that. 1535, there was a fire, it was melting uh, silver, burned it. But another little side issue that's not scientific is, it didn't burn the, mo the most major points of the image. A little bit of an accident in our favor. You can see a head here with long hair, crossed arms, blood coming out of wrists, knees and legs, uh, a lot of points in the scalp that are bleeding, scourge marks all over the back. You can see he's nude and all the way down his legs with scourge marks. All right, now just a little quickie on the history of it. We have circumstantial history and we have factual history that's 100% accurate. Circumstantial, obviously it starts in Jerusalem. To, uh, to keep it from being destroyed, they move it out of town to a natural trade route to Edessa, Turkey, 30 to 944, and then it gets picked up by the kings in the, in the rich Byzantine world of Constantinople. It's there from 944 to 1204. Then we think the Knights Templar actually pick it up and take it for about 150 years and use it. And then the yellow turns to white because white where documented history happens. This is in Lyre, France, where it was first shown to the public. Continued showing in Chambray, and finally it's now in the Turin Cathedral, where my wife and I saw it in the next position in 2010, and it's been there 1578 to now. All right, so this is, now I'm going to take you some quickies. I can't go through all the written um, reasons of circumstantial evidence, but I'm just going to pick one for each time period and quickly tell you what we mean by circumstantial evidence. All right, so when you come back, I can fill in a lot more. All right, so it goes to Odessa, Turkey, and that's where it's there that many years. All right, now, why do we think that? Why do we think that? It's because people have been drawing the pictures of the face of Jesus for years. So every single mosaic and every single painting that dates before 525 
paints a person that's clean shaven, short hair, young, right? No beard, no mustache. All of a sudden, 525, the image completely changes to what we now mostly accept as the appearance of Jesus' face. Long hair, beard, mustache, a little bit older looking, right? So something had to happen in 525 because from all time forward, nobody draws the face of Jesus like this anymore, right? When you look at a painting, crucifix, you go to the church, or whatever, it's always a long hair situation. But what happened in 525 is archaeological evidence that a flood took place. And the uh, potential then, and the, and the way the rumor goes, the way the theory goes, is that it was...